welcome to Fruity Knitting. This is episode 99. I'm Andrew. And I'm Andrea. We are an Australian couple living in Germany and it's actually a stunning day here in Offenbach today. It's really interesting. Through the whole period of the lockdown, the weather here has been absolutely beautiful. It's been beautiful clear skies, blue yeah. skies during the night and even clear skies at night time. Yeah. Blue skies during the day. <laughs> clear skies at night. Stars, everything. It's been great. Certainly helps you stay cheery during these somewhat strange times. Yeah, it does. We have a full and interesting program prepared for you today. Yes, our feature interview is with the double knitting expert, Alistair Post Quinn. And I first heard about Alistair from Amy Dechin, who we've had on the show recently. And Amy described Alistair as having developed double knitting way beyond anyone else. And that really caught my attention because... I just love finding new people to feature on the show who've really geeked out on different knitting techniques. And Alistair teaches nine different double knitting courses, combining lots of traditional knitting techniques together with double knitting. So he's developed uh, techniques like double knitting lace, double knitting cables, double knitting entrelac. The list kind of goes on and on and on. <laughs> Anything you can think of, I think he's, he's put together with, with double knitting. And I met him earlier this year at Vogue Knitting Live in New York, and I think you're going to really enjoy the interview and think of it as it'll it'll make you fall in love with knitting again because it just reminds you of the depth of possibilities that, that are out there. And it really doesn't matter if you can't yet do these difficult knitting techniques. It's just really wonderful and inspiring to know that they're out there waiting for you. Yeah. <laughs> We'll soon be in the merry month of May with its springtime connotations, associations, and one important springtime event for us as knitters is lambing season. It is lambing where it all begins for our beautiful woolen hats, scarves, and sweaters, and it's worth remembering that. It's also good to remember that this is a time of new life and joy, particularly right now. Yeah. Last year, we had Kim and Jennifer from Fleece and Harmony on the show to tell us about their lives during lambing season. Lots of you found that really interesting. So this year we've invited Kim Goodling from uh, Vermont Grandview Farm to join us. Kim breeds Gotland sheep and today she's going to tell us what she needs to do to be a good midwife to her flock of yeah. sheep. It's really informative. It is really interesting. Yeah. Really interesting. And there's also lots of great footage of extremely cute lambs running around. And, and drinking, and drinking, wagging their tails. Wagging their tails very contentedly. So if you have children or grandchildren in yeah. your cohort with you, um, you might enjoy watching this together with them. Definitely. And New Releases is also featuring in this episode. And for that, we go to Norfolk on the east coast of England. And we see a really beautiful shawl design that's been inspired by the flint work on the local Norfolk cottages and churches. And then, of course, Andrew and I are going to give you an update on our own projects. And we're going to talk a little bit about how to substitute yarns. And our daughter, Madeline, has come home and she's going to pop in and say hello as well. So it's a pretty full program, I think. <laughs> We're straight into under construction with me. I'm still working on Sky by Marie Wallen and I'm using the, oh, I've just dropped all my sister stitches. <laughs> I'm using the Hampshire four ply from the Grey Sheep Company. This is the natural color. This is the rose hip. It's a, a lovely salmon color. So I'm almost finished. I'm on the home run. The sleeves are joined to the body. But my concept of this design has changed a little bit since the last episode. And just so that you know what I'm talking about, I want to show you a picture of the original again. Here it is. It's such a stunning design. I think it's a really, really pretty design. But you can see that the jumper is short-waisted and the stranded colorwork section sits in the model's waist really neatly. There isn't any way shaping on the body of the jumper, but the colorwork section does look very slightly narrower than the twisted stitch patterning above the colorwork. The twister stitch fabric above looks like it's just gently blousing out over the color work around the waist. And this is the aspect about the design that I loved the most. It was what made me want to knit it, apart from it being just a really pretty design anyway. Well, it hasn't worked out like that for me. And I not I don't quite know why. I can you hold it for me on both? Yes. Thanks. So before I started, I did two swatches, one for the, the twisted stitch patterning and one for the color work section down below. And I got the gauge exactly. And since I've knitted it, I've also measured it and my gauge is also exactly right. So I don't know why, but you can see very that the color work section here is actually wider, has, has, is significantly wider than the twisted stitch patterning above. 
and when I try it on it doesn't look good. You can see also with the, like this is quite a strong pattern repeat. It goes from here to here. You can see it there and you've got these little sort of troughs <laughs> where these sections come in or pull in a bit more. That's because the background here is knitted and the background here is purled. So it gives you that sort of slightly lumpy bumpy look which is really pretty texture but you've got to be careful as to where those ridges show up along the silhouette of the body and when I tried it on I had the color work section was quite wide around my waist and then it had a little ridge at the top of the waist inwards. and it went inwards yeah and it just didn't look it didn't look right at all no. and so I pulled it down so that the color work was around the top of my hips and it just all looked kind of perfect as if that's how it was meant to be yeah so I've since decided that although I desperately wanted the short waist effect I'm going to go for a long long waisted jumper and I've got enough yarn I've got plenty of yarn so I've easily got enough yarn to, to put in extra length here and I've also, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking I might even give this jumper after a season's wear to Madeline. After a season's wear. <laughs> I sound so spoiled, don't I? Second but, hand. Yeah. Well, I can't sort of, I don't want to give it away straight away. I want to wear it. <laughs> <laughs> but and anyway, she looks good in no matter what. So I don't have to really be... No, normally she wears no matter what. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> she doesn't care what she wears. But she has the advantage of, of me, you know, you can put her in anything and she looks good. So I don't have to really think about a certain body shape that's going to look the best. So um, I don't know why that didn't work, but it's a bit of a shame. If But if you hold it up, just in case you're wondering, if... What I would do if I didn't have enough yarn and I really, really was determined to make it end up the way I had planned, I would cut it open at the top of this colour work section here because there's a couple of rows of plain stocking stitch in this neutral colour here. So that's the easiest place to cut it open. And then I would unpick down to the ribbing and redo the colour work section, which is a really easy pattern. You can see that on a smaller needle gauge and just check that yes it's actually going in it's going to be good and then I would regraft it. So I'm sure some of you are probably thinking why don't I just stretch this out and block, harsh block this out so that the twisted stitch section is wider than the colour work. I don't want to do that because it doesn't look like it needs to be that much wider but it is and especially because this is this acting a little bit like a rib in the fact that it wants to pull together like this, mm. the stitch patterning. So you do have to stretch it out quite a lot to be able to stay a little bit blues on. And I don't want to do that. I only do that, that kind of harsh blocking in extreme circumstances. So if there's absolutely no other alternative. And mainly because wool wants to go back. It will always tend to go back to where it was originally. And it means that every time you wash the garment, you, you can't just lie it flat and forget about it. You have to sort of pin it out again and make sure it's going to dry in the proper shape. And that's, I don't want to sign myself up for a lifetime of that work. That always sounds bad to yeah, me. Yeah, like you've got to you remember want. you're going to be doing that every time you wash that jumper for years to come. And that's yep. just, you don't want to do that. So that's one reason why you don't want to do it. The second reason is if you harsh block anything, you are sort of stretching and sometimes even breaking the fibers a little bit just to get them that extra width wide. And I just don't think that's a good start to a beautiful new jumper that's meant to last for a long time. So especially when you've got alternatives, you, you'll remember that I did harsh block the Morning Star bridal jacket that I finished early January this year. But I didn't have any alternative. It was either harsh block it or give it away. <laughs> and I didn't want to give it away. So, but but if you uh, just say you are, you want to do this design and you, like me, love the fact that the colour work sits directly in the waist and you want to make that a little bit narrower, what you could do is just start the design here with a provisional cast on knit this section and make sure that this is fitting you very well because it's the twisted stitch patterning that takes way more time than this. The colour work is very easy to knit. This is more cumbersome. It's, it's a lot of sort of through the back loop and, and manoeuvring and stopping and so it's not a fast knit this section. So you don't want to be re-knitting this section but if you if you started here, knit it up here, thought yep that fits me really well, 
This pattern is very simple, it's a mirror image, so you can read the chart backwards, downwards in other words. So you just start here, you try out a little bit and think yes it's definitely going in that's going to work or no it's not I have to go down a needle size and then you knit downwards so that's what I would do if I was going to do this design again. That seems very clever to me Dolph. Well it's just a different way of thinking things. Yeah. It's it's not difficult to do but it's it's um you just have to know that it's a possibility and then yeah you can do it. Now you might remember that I said last episode it was a 30 row pattern repeat so roughly from about here to here that meant that um, you have to end on the same pattern row on the sleeves and the body because then they have to be joined and you've got to keep knitting in, in pattern for three or four centimeters. So I only had the option of doing one full pattern repeat so I could end again on, on row 20 but luckily that has given me enough length for it to sit right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Otherwise, God knows what I would have done. <laughs> but anyway, I think it's going to be good and I hopefully will finish it by next episode to show you. This is under construction, but personally, I think it should be bring and brag because as you can see here, if you could help, please, Andrea. <laughs> Assistant, if you could assist. I have finished, I've completed the back part of my celestial design by Martin Story and I am, Andrea's just showing the drape there, I am yeah. extremely proud of myself. Look at these lovely waves. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really pleased with how it's looking and I got through it with very little trouble. I think there was one spot, Andrea, where I, I don't know, I dropped a stitch or something went funny and you had to save me. But apart from that, it was all plain sailing. I did notice that there was some big yep. stitch down. Yep. <laughs> we don't need folks on that. Are you going to fix that up? Can you fix that up I now? I can't fix that up. Can you do up. magic? I think what Andrew's done is split, split a stitch. There's a big one there. So, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Hold it up. It's pretty good though, isn't it? It is very good. The fabric's really nice. It's so shimmery. <laughs> That's because it's half cotton, half wool. It's a San Nascan yep. duo. Yep. So, this was a gentle start. It is all stocking stitch. Things are stepping up a notch or two now. Yeah. As we said in the last episode, the front part of this design includes a panel which has both lace and cables in it. And as we planned, I have now done a swatch of that section. I'll give you a nice close-up picture so that you can check out my progress. I have to say things are going rather more slowly on this piece <laughs> than on the very simple stocking stitch back piece. Um, but the pattern itself is actually fairly simple. It's um, a couple of stitches of stocking stitch and then there's the lace section. So it's really just eyelets um, every second stitch and then the cable. And then there's like this lace diamond in the middle which has the same stitch, same lace stock, uh, stitch as the other thing. And then it's all the same thing reversed on the other side. And from one row to the, to the next, it's all the same. It just shifts out one stitch each row to get around the diamond and it goes back again. And the diamond just grows one eyelet each row. And the pearl rows are all just plain pearl rows, which is really nice. So it's easy to remember. And it's at least on this swatch, it's easy to tell where I am. So I haven't actually been writing down the rows or anything like that. When I do the real front piece, which I'm just starting now, I have got stitch markers in there. I don't like work, working with stitch markers because I always knit them in. <laughs> so I was thinking you might <laughs> get this top. I've made you little woolen ones. Yeah, I know. You might get this top with little woolen stitch markers down the side. No, you use the same one. You no, just... they, they always get knitted in. That's the problem. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, I think you've done a pretty good job. You were doing the cable without the cable needle. That was the one thing that was difficult for me. Um, it's like the, the lace is pretty manageable. The one thing that is still difficult for me is doing the cables without using a cable needle. And what I find is, and it's pretty obvious, when I pull a needle out to move the two stitches, it's two by two cable, pull the needle out to move the stitches from the right hand needle to the left hand needle. The stitches on the left hand needle are okay, but getting the stitches back on the right hand needle, that didn't work. And you've had to save me several times just on this swatch. Although I do think my technique is getting better. And so I'm persisting. Good. I'm persisting. Otherwise, I mightn't finish this by next yeah, episode. Maybe. No, I'm sticking it out and, and I do think I'll get the hang of it and uh, be able to do it without falling back to the cable needle. We only knit watching television late at night and so often the button on the pause, the pause yeah. button gets put on. And Andrew goes, come and oh. save me again. I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah. So, but I'm pretty optimistic. 
It's looking really good. Yeah. It's very neat. Yeah. And this is just the front. So the front might be a bit of a struggle, but then the sleeves are just the plain stocking yeah. stitch again. So I'm you sure I'll get through you it. You haven't actually said what the design's called. The design is called Celestial. I did say that. Did you? Okay. Yes. And it's by Martin Story. Martin Story. And I was actually looking at it, Rowan Magazine. I was flicking through and there were lots of designs by Martin Story. I think he's a really good designer. And yes. I think he's got lots of, well, yes, he is. But I really liked it. And he's got lots of things for sort of spring, summer. So yeah, he's got beautiful designs. Yep. Coming up soon is our new releases segment. And today it features a, a design called Field Flint, which is inspired by the use of flint stone in the architecture around Norfolk in the east of England, as Andrea said. Now, before we go any further, I can't say flint stone without mentioning the flint stones. <laughs> And just in case you're one of our younger viewers and we know you're out there, um, I have found some footage to try to help you understand what we're talking about here. So check this out. So this was an animated television series produced in the 1960s and it was based on the lives of the Flintstones, Fred, Wilma and their daughter Pebbles, who are the modern Stone Age family. I, it was essential viewing during my childhood, and I still think it's brilliant. Andrea, you watched it whenever you had a chance, didn't you? Yeah, we you? didn't have a television didn't growing have a television. up, but I know, can you believe it? But I loved it whenever I went over to a friend's house. Yeah, yeah. I think it's so clever. Anyway, that's just to set the context of the Stone Age. Now, flint itself was a really critical material during the Stone Age, and the reason for that was that flint can really easily be made into tools like knives or axe heads or spears or arrowheads, so spearheads or arrowheads. And that's obviously a really valuable thing if you're a hunter and it's also pretty handy to have around the, the home if you're skinning your saber-toothed tooth tiger. Or You'd like to do that, would you? Skinning a saber-toothed tiger, yeah. I don't know how I'd go with that. <laughs> but if I did do it, I'd want to have something like a, a, flint. a flint knife <laughs> to do it. Um, so really, really important. And the, the way that you do that, flint stones are generally, they're just like round stones and they're normally something like the size of your fist. And you would actually just whack them and they're quite brittle. And so that you'd get chips coming off and these chips would have a sharp edge. The, the surface of the, the inside is like glass. It actually looks like glass. So you'd get the chip and you could use that directly as a knife or you could keep working that stone and sort of take bits away and you could form an axe head, something like that. And people do this, here's a picture of it. Um, people still do this, it's called napping, this technique. So really amazing uh, and really instrumental in that time. The other amazing property of flint is that you can strike it, like when it's struck against a piece of steel or if we're back in the stone age against a, a piece of stone which has some metal in it, it makes sparks and you can use these sparks to make fire. We which should is, go camping, you can try it out. depend on all of these things, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Or depend on you hunt, hunting and gathering yeah, and making yeah. a fire. We go to Norfolk, go camping in Norfolk. <laughs> <laughs> That's the condition. Okay. So you can make fire with it. And um, the Romans developed this into sort of specialised tools called fire steels, which were bits of steel which uh, sort of spring-loaded things to whack against a bit of flint to help them light a fire. Really the predecessors of the cigarette lighter, which is pretty funny. And then that went on to the flintlock firearm. Which My again, goodness, you really did your research. Totally. But <laughs> again, just whacking the piece of flint and here's the picture and you can see the little bit of flint there and you yeah. get a spark and it lights your gunpowder. I think it's two steps, but essentially lights the gunpowder and, and then you've got your gun. So really amazing technology. The question then is why do you use this amazing stone, which is a limited resource in the end, why do you use it for building buildings? And there are essentially two reasons, you know, we're not in You're the wasted. Stone Age anymore. You're not in the Stone Age anymore and we've found other ways to make a knife, right? So you go, through, <laughs> yes, it does. you go through the Bronze Age and the Iron Age and you find they're quite good for making knives and I guess there's some other technology for lighting fires in the meantime too. But the other reason, which I think is really funny, is you build buildings out of, out of flint in Norfolk because in Norfolk there is flint. And this is the general principle for building buildings out of stone. You use what's there. In the UK, you see it, don't you, in all yeah. the different areas. Yeah. And Norfolk yeah. is just around the world. It's one of the main places where you find huge deposits of flint. Um, in the US, it's Ohio. And I think Ohio actually has its national, I don't know if they call it the national, the state gemstone is flint because there's huge deposits of flint okay. in Ohio. Um, and as you travel through the UK, you can see the buildings are made of different types of stone. And this is because yeah. that's what's in the ground around that area. 
So last episode, I think we were in Northern Wales. We're always in Northern Wales. We're always in Northern <laughs> Wales. If you ever go to Northern Wales, you'll, you'll see, see slate everywhere. You'll see buildings made out yeah. of slate because in Northern Wales, there is a lot of slate. Yeah. In our last extreme knitting footage, you'll see it. I'll put a little yeah. bit of picture the here. The black. Yeah. yeah. So it's really amazing to think that the buildings that you see actually tell you what's in the ground underneath them. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I thought that was fun. Anyway, you can think about Slight all of detour. that. Yeah, think about all of that while you're watching this beautiful shawl field flint. And then straight after that, we go to our lambing session. Yes, that's right. So we're meeting Kim from Vermont Grandview Farm. She's going to show us a lambing season at the farm. Um, this is a uh, about birthing, so there are a few real scenes in there. If you're a little queasy, you might be a little. <laughs> you've be been a little forewarned. Bit, you've been warned. Just be a little bit careful. But we think it's it's fascinating, great thing to see. It's some real life on the farm. Yeah. Yep. Hi, I'm Jana from Norfolk Knots and I'm delighted to have this opportunity to talk to you today about my most recent pattern release which is Field Flint. So I live on the North Norfolk coast on the east side of England in the UK and we are at the moment battered by high winds and we have a very wild coastal area. We're also very well known for our flint cottages and flint churches and they were the inspiration for this pattern design. So it's a asymmetric triangular shawl. So you start knitting here by casting on about five stitches or so and using increases and decreases on either side of the rows as you go through and gradually increasing your number of um, stitches across the row and I've split the pattern into different sections to mirror the building um, materials so we've got what we call the brick courses and then these colour inserts which are the flint courses so it makes a very effective use of colour and it's a lot easier than it looks so in terms of making the different coloured inserts. Well, I'm not sure you're going to be able to see this on the video, but we have um, a range of stitch markers. We have, I'm using alternate colours, green, purple, green, purple. And then to get the pattern design, every other row you're doing wraps and turns around the green stitch markers or around the purple stitch markers, but the pattern will take you through all that. So in terms of the yarns that I've been using, I've been working um, very closely with two local indie dyers. And this is from um, the Colours of Norfolk collection by Aviva Lee. So all her dyes are natural dyes, cochineal, woad, lac, madder. And in this one, I've used um, three or four different colours to get the um, colour effect like this. So these are natural dyes which are actually quite vibrant and then another friend I've been working with who did this uh, shawl which is actually one of the um, test knit shawls when I was designing the pattern, she's using um, space dye to create her yarns and that's my friend Noodle Soup. My most recent version of Field Flint is this one, which I finished only last night. And as you can see, we've really gone for um, colour variation. And this is again uh, natural dyes. So this is Aviva's Colours of Norfolk range natural dyes. So I look forward to hearing from you if you feel like giving the shawl a go and would like any online support. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kim Goodling. I'm 
from Shepherd to a Flock of Gotland Sheep in Vermont. Today I'm just sitting here tagging some of my yarn to go in our online shop. Gotland sheep are known for their silver gray curls and we have some of their wool spun into yarn, some of it we sell as washed curls, and then others I use in my felting projects where I make felted garments and accessories to sell. Gotland sheep originate from Gotland Island, Sweden, and they're a relatively new breed in the United States. Today, I want to share a little bit with you about our farm and especially about lambing season. Some Gotland farms use artificial insemination to breed their ewes, but on our farm we use natural breeding and I have rams that are a very high percentage Gotland that I use. I usually breed my ewes in November, but this year we decided to breed a little bit early for parasite control. Here's how it works. Ewes always have parasites in them, and during the winter months, those parasites go dormant. Well, as soon as lambing season comes around, it's as if those parasites know that there are going to be more sheep for them to infect, and they become active again. When this happens, the ewes begin shedding hundreds and hundreds of parasite eggs. If the ewes are out on pasture, all those eggs are dropped in the field where the ewes and lambs will ingest them as they nibble the grass and graze. This can be very stressful on lambs because their immune system isn't fully developed yet and they are prone to have parasite overload. So by breeding a little bit earlier, all those eggs are being dropped on dry ground instead of in the field where the ewes are going to be grazing. Gestation in sheep is five months. Gotland sheep often have twins, but it's not unusual for them to have triplets and even quads. We've had lots of sets of triplets and a couple of sets of quads on our farm. One thing that I think is so fascinating is that sheep and women labor and deliver in a very similar fashion. In fact, I think sheep are the perfect model of how to go through labor and delivery. First of all, they have the exact same stages of labor as women. During first stage labor, their cervix is dilating. Once it's fully dilated, the uterus begins to work to push the baby through the birth canal, just like in women. Also, the way that sheep approach their labor is much like women do. During contractions, they will really concentrate and focus on that contraction and working with their body. In between those contractions, they'll rest. They may get up and walk around, they may sway, they may get something to drink, and they might even nibble on some food to get some extra energy. The other thing about sheep and women is that each of them have their own preferred way to labor. Some of my ewes want to be completely alone all through their labor and delivery, and they will isolate themselves from the flock. But other ewes need the comfort of their flock mates, and they will position themselves near the other sheep in the flock while they push their lambs out. Labor begins when a ewe starts to isolate herself, and I will see her either standing in a corner of the barn with her head down, or she may be in the paddock up against a fence all by herself. I know then that that cervix is dilating and that she's concentrating through those contractions. It can take anywhere from 6 to 24 hours after I first notice that a ewe is isolating herself until I feel that cervix is completely dilated. Some of my first time moms, that process takes a little bit longer, but once she's fully dilated, you'll see she will push a bag of water out and you'll see this, it looks like a big bubble hanging from her. And then with one of the contractions, that bubble will burst and amniotic fluid goes everywhere. That's when I know that it is now time for that you to get down to business and work hard to push her baby through the birth canal. The lambs present themselves normally with their little front hooves coming first and their nose. So if I'm there, that's what I look for. I'll look for these two little hooves and little tiny nose and if I see it, 
then I know that lamb is in the right position and is going to slip through that birth canal pretty easily. I think one of my greatest challenges as a shepherd is knowing when to intervene during this process. I would like to respect the ewe's natural ability to labor and deliver on her own, and it's my goal that each of my ewes are able to deliver their babies completely on their own. I will give my ewes up to two hours to push their babies out. That's a little bit longer than some other people do, but I've gotten really good at figuring out when I need to intervene. The signs and symptoms that I see that indicate to me that my U is in distress are things like teeth grinding. When sheep are grinding their teeth, you know that they're in pain, or they may be doing excessive groaning, or they may have just kind of given up and they've stopped working because they're exhausted and they have no more energy. I try to step in and intervene as soon as I see any of those symptoms happening, which actually is not very often. Gotland sheep are known to be very proficient at lambing and delivering their own lambs. But if I do see that, often I just need to glove up and go in and make sure that the lamb is in the right position. Or it may be that I can already see the little front feet and the little nose and the lamb is probably just really large and the ewe's having trouble getting it up over that pelvic bone. And so I just need to give a little tug to help it get over this pelvic bone and through the birth canal. Another really critical stage to labor and delivery is after the lamb is born, the ewe will begin to nicker and call to her lamb and lick it clean. This is very crucial in their bonding stage. And if it is interrupted, then the ewe can sometimes reject her lamb. That actually happened to us this year. I had a first time mom who had triplets that third lamb came very quickly after the second one, and she didn't have time to clean the second lamb before the third one was born. When the third lamb was born, she focused all her attention on that lamb. It was as if that second lamb didn't exist. And even though I slid the lamb over next to the one that had just been born, she still ignored it and focused all of her attention on that third one. I think in her mind, she either thought that second lamb wasn't healthy or because she didn't have time to lick it and talk to it and bond with it, she just didn't think it was hers and she rejected it. Well, when that happens, I will take the mom and put her in a stanchion. A stanchion will hold her in place so that the lambs can nurse. She can't look behind her to see who's nursing and she can't smell them, so she can't tell when that rejected lamb is nursing. Usually, if I do this for five to seven days, that you will accept the rejected lamb eventually. It's as if she's forgotten which lamb she didn't like and she'll let them all nurse. Well, in this case, after about day three, I noticed that that rejected lamb was not thriving. Her two brothers were, they were growing, they were getting stronger, they were bouncing around, but she wasn't. And so I knew she wasn't getting the milk that she needed, even though the mom was letting her nurse. So I pulled her out, and what we discovered is that she had a very weak sucking reflex. And there are a lot of different reasons why this happens, but the important thing was that I needed to get nourishment to her. So I began tube feeding, at the same time trying to get her to take a bottle. Well, it was a bit of a struggle and a bit of a touch and go for about a full week, but finally she figured out how to suck from that bottle. Now she's healthy and strong and growing and just an absolute joy to be around. 
Once all of my ewes have had their lambs, I put them all together and that first day it can be quite loud in the barn and very chaotic. You've got ewes and lambs running all over the place trying to figure out who's who. I've got ewes bagging for their lambs and smelling all the lambs around them and I've got lambs bagging for their moms running around trying to find their own mom. Well, in the end, sheep can count, and my ewes remember how many lambs they had. They remember exactly what they smelled like, and once they find them, they gather them around them. And if another ewe comes up to them, they'll give her a headbutt as if to say, back off, these are my lambs. So it's really quite a fun day and a little bit chaotic. It is this rhythm of new life that we love so much about lambing season. Every year brings new joy during this time of the year. And this year, it was especially wonderful to have all these lambs bouncing around in the barnyard while we still had snow on the ground. That last scene was just hilarious. I love the little tails wagging furiously of the yeah. lambs while they're drinking. Yep. Yeah. Do you think there's a biological reason for that? It's just joy. How does tail wagging? Don't you wagging? remember Madeline? You know, if you see a newborn Did baby she wag tail? and they want to have a drink, they're like, <gasps> <laughs> Yeah, that was definitely the highlight of her day. Yeah, she yeah. loved it. <laughs> But it's interesting to see the lambs, how they have to get down on their um, their elbows. front knee yeah, and their elbows and have their head back to drink. I suppose yeah. the bottles have just been set up to imitate uh, drinking from a, a ewe. Yep. So I found that really informative. I liked hearing about the parasites. That was really interesting. You've got to learn so much when you're a farmer. Mm -hmm. There's a constant cycle of learning. I think particularly if you weren't brought up on the land and you didn't sort of get that knowledge sort of given to you as you grew up. Yeah. I think yeah. you're constantly, you would be constantly researching and finding new things out. But the other thing I thought was fascinating is that you just don't want to disturb a you when she's giving birth because she just will reject one of her babies. Yeah, especially if she's got four. Yeah, it's a good thing I didn't do that because no. I was really disturbed during my labour. Yeah. Yeah, we won't tell that story today, but yes. <laughs> I suppose if I had four babies, I might have rejected one of them. <laughs> you could have lost one along the I way. I could have lost one, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thanks, Kim. That was really, that was really interesting and, and a lot of fun. And Kim is offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 15% discount off her Gotland yarn and roving, as well as her knitting patterns and kits from her online store. Her yarn comes in fingering weight and DK weight in two different natural shades of grey. And there's also some white yarn. But most of her yarn is from her Gotland sheep and it's blended with a little bit of silk, which gives the natural grey shades a heathered look. And her white yarn comes from one particular ewe named Mara, who is a Gotland border Leicester cross. So thanks, Kim. And Jana, who's Norfolk Knots on Ravelry, is also offering Fruity Knitting patrons a discount. Patrons will get 25% of her Field Flint shawl pattern from her Ravelry store. So thanks very much to Jana as well. So if you are watching, we do ask you to make a small contribution every month by becoming a patron. This is Andrew and my full-time job. We don't earn an income doing anything else related on the side. We don't sell anything. And we don't receive any money through sponsorship or advertising. The show is only possible through the support of patrons and every single patron counts for us, particularly now during this time. So if you are watching, please do take the step to become a patron. And thank you so much to all of the viewers who have done that and made the show possible so far. So our daughter Madeline has just popped in to say hello and give you an update on the project that she's been working on for over a year. <laughs> You've had long pauses on it. Yes. So tell us about it. 
Um, yeah, so this is the Bresser by Marie Wallen. It's a feral yoke sweater and you can see it in her Shetland collection. It uses Jameson's Spindrift fingering weight yarn uh, in a whole lot of different colors, not just this one. So you knit it from the bottom up and in the round and then you join the sleeves to the body and knit the yoke. So before Christmas I'd finished all these plain stocking stitch parts and they're still missing about four centimeters of ferrule pattern before we then join them together and knit the yoke. Yeah. Um, so you're gonna use all of these yeah. colors, aren't you? Yes. In the, in the ferrule section. They're absolutely stunning. It's a, just a typical Marie Wallen design of utter pleasure and delight to the eyes. Yes. <laughs> it's gonna be beautiful. I have to also tell everyone that this is, it, the body in the sleeves is knitted on a 2.75 millimeter needle. So that's really fine. So it does take you a long time, but you've gone for months without knitting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we'll start you off on the ferrule on the body first because it'll be easier than trying to do learn f or do difficult ferrule on magic loop. Mm -hmm. So I think once you've done a few inches on the body, you'll be fine. Then you do it on the, on the sleeves yep. and it'll get much better. Yeah. Sounds good. But tell them about the hat. Um, yeah, well... The hat is a project I did first because I'd actually hoped to finish the um, the jumper during our Christmas holidays in Wales, but then mum said I should practice the ferrule technique because I'd never done that before on a simple hat pattern. So you could learn it with two hands. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I did that and this is the result. This is the Glacier hat by Toft and mum bought it for me as a kit. So it um, included the hat pattern, the yarn and this pom-pom. It's a pretty easy pattern, as you can see, so it's good for beginners like myself. Yeah. And I think the result is really cool. I'm very happy with it. Although it did uh, end up being a bit too small in the beginning, so we had to stretch it when I blocked the hat. And we were worried that I would run out of the cream colour. Or the beige, yeah. Yeah, the beige colour. Um, so if there would have been more wool, I just would have made the hat a bit slouchier. It does fit, but as it is, it's a rather snug hat. Yes. I love the pom-pom. Yes, that's the cherry on the icing. <laughs> you can take it on and off like a button, which is nice for when you want to wash the hat. Yeah. 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 And it's really hilarious because it's just so big. It's nearly as big as the hat itself. So Go on the side cool. so they can see. So it's yeah. pretty cool. But it would look good also slouchy. But it fits you. Mm -hmm. It still fits you really well. Yeah. Cool. Yes. It's such a huge pom-pom, isn't it? I think the one you got is a little bit smaller. Yeah. It's in brown. That's true. Yeah. yeah. So, well done. Okay, so that's your practice. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you still remember how to do it because you did this hat a couple of months ago. Yeah, it wasn't too <laughs> difficult though. So so if she's still here in a couple of weeks' time, you can give an update. Yes. On Hopefully you've done a little bit on the body by then. Mm -hmm. But um, now that you're here, you, you're kind of stuck here now, aren't you? But uni is finished for you or, or is it just put on hold? Actually, we had a semester holidays. It's going to start now but because of the coronavirus. We're just putting everything online. So... Yeah, yeah. It'll, it'll work out fine. And you've been teaching some of your friends to knit. Yes, I have. <laughs> um, I've taught two friends of mine how to do the basic knit and purl stitch. And one of them, she made up her own moss stitch pattern and she knitted herself a really gorgeous scarf. And the other one came to me because she wanted to knit her boyfriend a Christmas present. And so she wanted to make him a scarf and keep it really easy and simple. So I suggested that she could do one in a plain stocking stitch, but that wasn't the best advice I could have given her because I forgot that the edges end up curling in on themselves yeah. when you do a stocking stitch material. Um, yeah, but I do think she managed to straighten them out after blocking the scarf and her boyfriend was very happy with the results. So Good. I think it was a success all the same. <laughs> I hope she still wants to knit. Yes. <laughs> Would be fun if we both sat in class and just knitted together as we watched a lecture. Yeah. You yep. can do that here in Germany. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for joining us. My and pleasure. we might see you next in the in the next episode with a little bit yep. of progress. Yeah. See ya. So Andrew's back again. It's magic. Yes. <laughs> I just want to have a quick talk about substituting yarns because I've substituted yarns for this project and I've had a couple of questions on how to do that. If very clever experienced people can probably substitute any crazy yarn for any project. You just have to be prepared to do 
enough crazy maths and alter the pattern and change things around and you could make any yarn probably fit to any project. And you get a crazy result. You might, yeah. <laughs> but if you're new to this and you just want to feel really confident, there's just a couple of guidelines that you have to follow and they're pretty easy once you know what they are. So the first thing you want to do is match the fibre content. So if your recommended yarn says it's 100% wool, don't go for 100% cotton or 100% alpaca because even if you can get your substitute yarn to knit up at exactly the same gauge, chances are that the fabric is not going to look or behave in the same way. So your project may not end up looking like the photo in the pattern. So the first thing to do is match the fibre content. The second thing to do is to match the, the, the way the yarn has been spun. So you want to pick a similar spinning technique. For example, if your recommended yarn is 100% wool, it's worsted spun and it's a three-ply yarn, that means it's going to be a very round, perfectly round yarn with very clearly defined edges. And that means that each stitch you're going to see very clearly the edges of. It's going to look very, very clear. <laughs> <laughs> very clear stitch definition. Don't substitute that with another 100% wool yarn that might be woolen spun or two-ply because woolen spun just means that the, the fibres have been spun together or higgledy-pickledy and the edges of the yarn is going to be more fuzzy. So you won't get that clear, smooth line. And two-ply lies in an oblong kind of pattern, not perfectly round. So the shape of the stitches is going to be different. So even, again, even though it might, you might be able to get it up to, to knit at exactly the same gauge, the fabric is not going to look the same. So match the fibre content, match the spinning technique. Yeah. Do you want to say I something? Thought, I thought you said wool and spun with your first yarn there, but maybe Did I was I? wrong. Okay. I don't know. No, I'm saying worsted. worsted spun three-ply is very different to wool and spun two-ply, even right. though they're both 100% wool. So obviously if you've matched the fibre content and the spinning technique you have to obviously get the same thickness on the yarn so it's going to it's going to knit up to the same gauge. Now thicknesses are also called weights and you get a whole lot of different ones so you can get lace weight which is a very fine yarn then you've got the fingering weight which is a sock yarn uh, typically and DK weight which is a typical jumper yarn and you get thicker and thicker with worsted Aran bulky etc. What can be misleading for, for um, inexperienced knitters here is that not all of these weights are uniform between different brands or between countries. So you might find a, uh, a lace, a, a, a fingering weight yarn that actually looks closer to a lace weight or a, a DK weight yarn that looks closer to a fingering weight yarn. That's typically the case in Scandinavian countries. Their yarns are always on, slightly on the thin side. <laughs> they, they all look a little bit thinner. But even, you just get quite a variation between brands. So what you need to do there is to look closer at the technical information and look at the meterage or yardage per grams. So, for example, if you've got two, two balls of yarn, they're both 100% wool, they're both worsted spun they both look the same you might think yeah they both look like a fingering weight are they a good match you have to have a look at the yardage or meterage per 100 grams so this is 100 gram skein and it has 400 meters this is a 100 gram skein and it has 333 meters so that shows you immediately that this is going to be thicker so it's going to be it's not going to knit up to exactly the same gauge easily, so they're not a good match. You don't have to have them exactly both 400 metres. You could have one 400 and the other 380 or 400 and 420. That's fine, but not such a big difference as 400 and 333. That shows that this is really not a good match. So just to recap, match the fibre, match the, st the spinning technique, match the meterage or yardage per 100 grams. This is where a problem can come in though because this is where the fibre content is really important. 400 metres of alpaca or cotton is going to weigh more than 400 metres of wool, particularly if that wool is wool and spun so it's got more air in it. So that's why first of all match the fibre content and then the spin spinning content, the, the spinning style and then 
the, the meterage. If you do all of that, you're really going to have success. You can't go wrong. That's, that's really how to play it safe. So having said that, if I go back to my project, which I've substituted a yarn for, it looks like I've broken the rules because this garment was uh, recommended using the felted tweed, which is 50% wool, 25% uh, alpaca and 25% viscose and it's on the label it says it's a DK weight yarn and the yarn I'm using is the Hampshire four ply it's 100% wool and it's and it's a four ply so it's a fingering weight yarn so on the surface it looks like they're poorly matched I would never have thought of substituting them if Marie Wallen hadn't told me personally that this is a good substitute for most of her patterns that she's used the felted tweed with so, and I did that very successfully on this garment and I didn't have to do any recalculation so I knew that, that they are a good match. Now, if you look at it and think, okay, logically, why has that worked out? This would be how I would diagnose that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this isn't a DK weight yarn even though it's got DK written on it, in my opinion, because there's too much meterage for a 50 gram. It's there they're pretty much exactly the same okay so this is 100% wool it's worsted spun this is worsted spun and it's 50% wool so the majority of the blend is in wool it's going to behave more like wool than anything else it's only got 25% alpaca that's not a lot so it doesn't have a huge effect on the character of the wool they're both like I said they're both wool and spun and so they're, they're pretty much behaving in exactly the same way, except for the viscose content. The viscose, in case you didn't know, when it heats up, it just, um, it stretches very slightly. So what I've noticed in my garments here, after a few wears, they will be very, very slightly, a little bit bigger. It's a bit like wearing jeans that you've, you've washed, then you put them on, they're nice and tight, and then after a couple of wears, they're a little bit baggy. It's not as extreme as that, but after a wash, it does go back. It's just very slightly like that. So that's how it's different. But apart from that, they substitute very well. Andrew also substituted yarn. This pattern yep. was the, the recommended yarn was the Rowan Cotton... Uh, Cotton glacé. Yeah, glacé, that's yep. it. Okay, which is 100% cotton. And he's substituted it with the Sun Nisgarn, which is 50% cotton, duo, 50% cotton, 50% wool. So again, it's going to behave, it's got 50% cotton in it, it's going to behave like that. The meterage is exactly the same, it's both eight ply, so it's been spun in exactly the same way, and he's able to get exactly the same gauge from it. So there you go. I hope that sort of gives those of you who are less confident more confidence. <laughs> You may not be able to see this in the video, but Andrea is actually older than she was in the last episode. It was Andrea's <laughs> birthday on Saturday. I think you're going to say which birthday it was. Yes, it was my 50th. Yep. Yay, so, I'm a half birthday. a century. <laughs> happy birthday, darling. Still looking gorgeous. <laughs> we had a really great birthday celebration planned for Andrea. Andrea's yeah. mum was actually coming over. She booked a flight and everything coming to Europe, and she was going to come and meet us in Baden-Baden, which you have seen on the show. And I haven't Madeline seen was, my mum for about seven, six years. Yeah. We haven't been back to Australia for that long at least. No. Yeah. Uh, Madeline was going to come to Baden-Baden as well and we were going to have a great weekend there. But, of course, that's all been cancelled like so many other things in these crazy times and we had to figure out how to handle that situation, <laughs> which brings us back to our last episode where we talked about the ancient cynics, so um, <laughs> which is a school of philosophy. The ancient cynics believed that to lead a good and happy life, you had to give up on worldly desires like wealth and power and birthday parties. <laughs> and I have to say, we saw the picture of uh, the philosopher, the cynic philosopher Diogenes living in his barrel because that was that where was he lived. That was last episode. And rejecting all the, the worldly pleasures. That was the, the birthday presents from Alexander the Great. Yeah. Um, so... I have to say, I didn't find that so appealing as a philosophy to live by, and I'm not sure that it would have been so satisfying for you for your 50th birthday. No, I don't really want to live in a barrel. No. It's a little bit like hardcore camping. And you can do it in your 20s, but not in your 50s. Yeah, but I don't think you would have liked to have gone without any birthday presents either. No. <laughs> anyway, if fortunately, if you read on philosophical history, you soon come to the Stoics. Okay. And the Stoics also had their ideas about nature. Um, they believed that 
rather than being intrinsically good or bad, things like power and wealth and birthday parties. Um, it all depends on how you treat it and how you use View those. it or use them. Yeah. So I think I'd use them very well. <laughs> seems much more reasonable to me. So one of the most famous Stoics was uh, Marcus Aurelius. He was Roman emperor from 161 to 180 AD. So he ruled over the entire empire. And he was actually empire, uh, emperor in the period that the plague went through the Roman Empire, which is kind of interesting to stumble across right now. That was the smallpox plague, wasn't They think it? it was smallpox, yeah. yeah. It went on for 15 years, um, and they actually named it after Marcus Aurelius, this plague, which is quite an honour. So he actually had the experience, and it's interesting to see, he had the experience of ruling over a, a land where they had not only the health crisis, but also the financial crisis, and he had to deal with that, and he stayed there in Rome right through the whole thing. Um, but one of the principal or principal ideas of the Stoics was that nothing's either good or bad, but you have to live in agreement with nature. And that means adapting your will to the reality or around you. Or your expectations. Your expectations, yes. And that's exactly what we had to do with your birthday. I was wondering how we were going to get from it's here to all, wherever. all entirely relevant. This is entirely relevant. Okay, to okay. Here, right? so. so instead of going off and having a nice dinner at a hotel and whatever, I went to the market yeah. and I bought some nice steaks and some asparagus and Madeline cooked a cake. Madeline did come to us, as you've seen, and she cooked a beautiful cake. And I think we had a dinner which was as good as anything we it could was. have expected. It was. It was really delicious. We had a couple of bottles of yeah. Australian red wine, and that was really good yeah, too. Yeah, that was great. So that all worked out really well. I did have one other challenge. I did the research, of course, and Andrea said for her birthday she wanted a new experience for her birthday. <laughs> And I was a little bit constrained because, you know... It's pretty hard to get a new experience when everyone's in lockdown. Yeah, don't go near anyone. Yeah. Don't leave your house. But I did do something and it's slightly controversial. Yes, yes. Um, I bought us a couple of cigars. So this is our new experience. Just uh, to, we, we don't smoke so we're, and we're, we're not, not advocating, we're not endorsing smoking. But this is going to definitely be a new experience. Yeah, we're not sure whether it's going to be a good experience or a bad experience. We've done some research. It's absolutely a surprise. <laughs> it was a really funny surprise. It was funny because then we did we looked it all up because there is a real art to smoking cigars. Apparently you have yeah. to light it in a way that it's perfectly uniform and because you don't inhale the smoke. It's all no. about taste apparently. Yep. And there's a real technique of of inhaling it only in in your mouth. Yep. And then um, and how fast there has to be a certain the timing rhythm. and everything. Yeah, so that. it's it's a real art. Yep. So that's certainly very funny. This is where stoicism has led us to cigar to smoking. We yeah. haven't done it yet. <laughs> and we are clear they're addictive and dangerous and all of that. This is probably not something we're going to do every day. Yeah. yeah. So, so no comments about that, please. Yep. Just... <laughs> yep. But it, maybe we'll like it, maybe we won't. But we, I... might, we might report back or it might be something that we'd really rather forget. <laughs> the problem is that we've run out of our whiskey and I really kind of think that it would be great to have some dark chocolate, some whiskey, and a cigar. To me, that that all goes together. Okay. But yeah, that was a pretty that was a pretty funny birthday present. Yep. Yep. <laughs> anyway, the other piece of news is next episode you may have picked up is our one hundredth episode. Yeah. Yeah. So we're not exactly sure how we're going to what format that episode's going to take. We had thought we might show you a few more behind the scenes scenes of you know how we edit how we put everything together what yep. things look like we do have to watch people's privacy too because you know we have guests on the show and we can't show everything that goes on yeah and but besides, we might it's pretty hard to make a whole lot of work look interesting viewing <laughs> yeah we might also answer some questions about ourselves we are also very private people are we yeah okay so feel free <laughs> but, to put some questions in the comments below we won't promise to answer them because there's yep. some questions we never answer yeah. Yeah. But, but coming up right now is some extreme double knitting with the wonderful Alastair Post Quinn, who is really quite a remarkable man. He has come up with some incredible techniques and he has a really um, careful way of thinking or careful approach to developing those techniques so that they are very sort of clean, elegant solutions. You'll hear him talk about that. Yeah. I really enjoyed that part. Yeah. So enjoy the interview. And we'll see you in two weeks. Yep. Thanks for being with us. Bye. Bye.
welcome to Fruity Knitting. We have a really exciting guest today. Joining me is Alastair Post Quinn, who's really the king of double knitting. Since the 1980s, more knitters have been exploring double knitting and pushing the boundaries of the technique to include more complex color and structural variations. And in recent years, Alastair has become known as one of the most innovative double knitters because of how he's combining double knitting with other knitting techniques. Alistair's written two books, Extreme Double Knitting and Double or Nothing, and he's also a very active teacher. Alistair, you really do have stunning designs and the techniques behind them are so interesting. So we're very thrilled to, to be able to present you and your work on Fruity Knitting. So thank you for being here and welcome. Well, thanks so much, I'm glad to be here. Let's start with your childhood crafting experiences. I know you did origami as a child and throughout your teenage years. So can you tell us how important crafting and knitting was for you as you were growing up? Sure. Um, I, was a, I was a pretty crafty child. My, my parents were very uh, musical and artistic types and they uh, um, nurtured my, my crafty inclinations. Um, I picked up cross stitch. I picked up um, some weaving when I had access to looms. I did a little bit of Chinese knot work when I lived in Taiwan for a year. Um, but I never actually learned to knit. Uh, my grandmother and mother knitted, but they never gave me uh, any lessons on that. I think they didn't want to give me pointy sticks. Um, but origami, I picked up when I was four, and uh, I, I actually started teaching it when I was uh, 12, and uh, I started sort of doing these, uh, these little um, what you might consider color work designs. Um, and uh, this was sort of a, a focus of mine um, uh, uh, throughout my teenage years. Uh, and when I went to college, I actually ended up majoring in studio art where I focused on sculpture. Um, and so all of that, uh, all of that three dimensional stuff sort of went into, uh, uh, went into my eventual knitting. Just going quickly back to the origami, I could see that you've done something slightly more unusual with origami. Was that mm -hmm. sort of the forerunner of, of double knitting or working with colours, do you think? Just say a little bit about what you were doing with origami because I think it was a bit different. Yeah, it might very well be. I mean, I was using, um, I was using uh, both, um, both sides of the paper and doing these geometric patterns, which was quite different from what anyone else was really doing at the time. Um, uh, these things were, were, um, perhaps, uh, a, a predecessor to my, to my interest in geometric forms and knitting. Um, but I think it was mostly just, um, that I, I have a proclivity for the, the geometric in design in general. And so it came out in the origami and it came out in the knitting. Can we just get straight into the technique of double knitting and just to keep the viewers on board who may not know what double knitting is, could you start by giving us a definition and then perhaps go on and, and just say something about its history. So who were the main established double knitters before you? What, were their, um, what was their contribution and which ones influenced you the most? Sure. So double knitting is at its most basic a method of doing a fabric with no wrong side. Um, here's a piece from my early days called Corvus. Um, this one is, uh, uh, as you can see, um, the motif shows up on both sides in opposite colors and opposite orientation. You actually get two separate layers. You can pull them apart up until the colors change. So this is one a uh, very common way of dealing with double knitting now, but the original way that it was done was actually a tubular or single color method, and it was it was uh, um, documented very well in uh, Beverly Royce's book from um, uh, from the 1980s. So this would have been used for things like uh, glove fingers or uh, any sort of small diameter tube, um, where you could actually use uh, slip stitch double knitting, uh, tubular slip stitch double knitting uh, on a single needle to do um, uh, little tubes or any, any size tube on a single needle. If we just go back to um, a technique that's found in, I think, quite a few different traditional cultures of knitting the sock within a sock, is that also considered a form of double knitting or the start of double knitting? 
It is. And as a matter of fact, the very first mention of that technique, which probably was not called double knitting at that point, but uh, um, it is a similar technique, um, was in uh, an 1800s German knitting text, um, which uh, describes that sock within a sock trick. Um, the purl sides are out at that point, um, which really makes it a lot easier to do that without uh, twisting and linking the socks together. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I think that may very well have been the, um, the predecessor to all of this. And um, why do you think you're drawn to double knitting above all the other techniques? Well, I just I just love the uh, the reversibility concept, and um, I've, I I like doing things that are a little um, out of the ordinary. Um, uh, and so the reversibility was where I started, but then when I realized that I could add in other techniques and um, uh, figure out how to make a whole bunch of single layer techniques reversible uh, that were not already reversible. That really fascinated me and I just haven't found the end of it yet. So how would you describe yourself then as a designer? So what's really important to you in your work and also when you're writing your patterns? Well, for me, process is just as important as product. Um, I, I really enjoy the process of double knitting. Um, and I, I really want other people to enjoy it as much as they enjoy the, uh, the finished objects. Uh, so much of my designing work is, is sort of problem solving. Um, and to that end, I have a, a philosophy of what I call the elegant solution. So um, I have a list of, of, uh, of properties for an elegant solution. Um, and so a truly elegant solution is going to have as many of these properties as possible. Um, they are simplicity. Um, an elegant solution will simplify even a difficult technique. Um, efficiency, minimizing unnecessary movement. Uh, economy, using the smallest amount of yarn necessary. Um, purity, uh, staying within the vocabulary of double knitting. Uh, universality, um, so an elegant solution will work in all appropriate circumstances. Repeatability, it will work time and time again with the same result. Um, and of course, attractiveness. If it's not attractive, it's not really a solution. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool to hear you talk like that because those words of repeatability and universality and um, what else did you say? Attractiveness, obviously, and versatility. They, it reminds me of what you want to apply to, to music when you're learning music or when you're performing music. And, and also, I suppose that applies to all of the art forms. So it's interesting to hear you say that here. <laughs> Okay, now, before we get on to more technical questions, I'd really love the viewers to see some of your designs because I'd like them to get all excited about the possibilities that there are about with double knitting. So could you show us, say, five contrasting designs and just talk us through the techniques that you've used? So I'm going to show you um, a few of my pieces with the biggest wow factor. Um, to be clear, I'm not trying to scare you off. I'm just trying to... Um, I'm trying to show you what you might be able to do with this after you've got a really good foundation of double knitting. That's brilliant, because that's exactly what I want you to show. I want you to show the wow pieces. <laughs> All right, fantastic. So um, the first one I want to show is Parallax 2.0. Um, and this piece is um, one of a series of op art patterns that I designed in the, uh, they're called the Parallax Collection. And um, this one, as you can see, is on the bias, uh, which um, I wanted to show the, uh, the expansion points here and the compression points here in the same scarf without making it uh, double wide. So I sent it on the bias and that made it really intriguing. And it's also done in this long, long gradient uh, yarn by County. This is the Falling Blocks hat. This is multicolor double knitting. Uh, this is actually one of the very first um, patterns I put out as a standalone pattern. Um, this is an updated version for my revised edition of Extreme Double Knitting. And as you can see, I'm using three colors in any given row, um, but that's not all. <laughs> uh, the other side of this is a completely different three color pattern. Um, and 
the original version of this, I, I didn't know how to do the, uh, the decreases all the way to the crown with, in both patterns, but in the revised edition, I actually did go all the way to the crown. So it is a completely three color piece all the way to the top. It's beautiful, and the both of the crowns are really spectacular. Thank you. Um, this is Victorian raffia. This is one of the big eye catchers, also done in a, a county gradient yarn. Um, this was originally a practice piece that I did for um, uh, learning how to do uh, increasing and decreasing and double knitting really, really well. And it can be uh, the same sort of practice piece for you, if you like. Um, it is. Uh, it has 12 different uh, increases and decreases if you count both layers. And it is actually a, um, a collaborative piece between me and uh, the Irish designer Kieran Foley. And um, you can probably recognize his style in this. And as a matter of fact, the pattern itself, Scandinavian, uh, has been modified um, somewhat uh, and of course made into double knitting. So he and I split the proceeds on this pattern. So this is the 52 pickup scarf. Um, as you can see, it's made out of uh, made out of cards. Um, each card is charted individually. Um, it is in three color, two pattern double knitting, similar to the falling blocks hat, but done flat. Um, the cards are actually done so that they have a back and a front. Um, so each card is charted individually. The entire pattern is about 120 pages long, although you only need about a quarter of the charts uh, as each card is charted four times for different positioning. That's, that's incredible. So each, each card is actually upside down at least. I don't play cards much, so I'm trying to visualize it all. <laughs> they're, they're charted so that uh, each card can be knit um, right side up, face up, right side up, face down, upside down, face down, upside down, face up. Okay. So uh, it's a bit of an extreme piece, uh, but it was a lot of fun to design and a lot of fun to knit, honestly. <laughs> so just really quickly, when you're knitting with three colors, how do you mm -hmm. divide the colors up between your hands? Again, I still only use uh, one hand to do it all. Um, and that third color just strands in between the layers. As long as you're bringing both yarns to the back and both yarns, or all three yarns to the back, all three yarns to the front at the same time, um, you can still use a knit for one layer, a purl from the other layer, and the third color just strands in between automatically. So do you st just hold two colors in, in your f amongst your fingers and the third one you drop and just pick it up whenever you need it? Is that how you do it? Or Well, for me, I actually hold on to all three of them sort of in a, in a group. Um, but it's, uh, it is one of the challenges for this technique uh, that people have to figure out what to do with that third color. Um, uh, I've I've taught many classes on multicolor double knitting, and it it, uh, um, it is one of the biggest challenges about it. Once you've got that down, once you've figured out what to do with that third color um, as you're knitting, then the technique itself is not all that difficult. <laughs> so I got one more piece to show, and it's a big one. Um, so I'm gonna try to try to make sure that you can see the whole thing. Although you won't be able to, it's two and a half meters wide. It is. Um, called Adenith. Uh, it means wings in Welsh, and uh, it is a double knit lace shawl uh, in the Faroese style. There's no actual garter tab, it's a double knit tab, um, but it's the same general structure. And as you can see, if I turn it over, it is double knit all the way um, from one end to the other. It's completely stunning. Thank you. So out of the, th the five that you've shown us, what is the most technically difficult? I would say either the Adenith shawl or the uh, Victorian raffia, um, just for the sheer number of techniques that are involved in both of them. So you're doing a lot of teaching in workshops. What kind of knitter do you think is really enjoying knitting your, your patterns and designs? I use the, I use the word adventurous in, my, uh, in, in a lot of my printed matter. Um, uh, my book, Extreme Double Knitting, its subtitle is uh, uh, New Adventures in Reversible <laughs> Color Work, and Double or Nothing's subtitle, Reversible Knitting for the Adventurous. So I think you've got an answer there. It's the adventurous people, uh, the people who are always looking for a new challenge, a new, um, uh, a new technique, something interesting to keep their minds and hands busy and uh, um, 
and adventuring. So what does a new knitter who's new to double knitting need to know beforehand just to increase their chance of success or their feeling of confidence? And can you perhaps also say something about which yarns work best? Double knitting is basically just a knit and purl technique. Um, so if you can knit and purl, you can double knit, um, or at least you can learn the basic techniques. Getting it clean and consistent is a little more of a challenge, but just like anything else, it comes with practice. Um, I feel like the best way for it to feel natural is for you to tackle something that's a little on the larger side. Um, once you've learned the basic technique, do something like a cowl, a scarf, a baby blanket if you're feeling really, uh, really into it. But, you know, a pot holder or a... Or a uh, um, headband. <laughs> a headband or something like that isn't, isn't necessarily going to give you the muscle memory that you want. Yeah. Um, so, you, you know, as I've mentioned already to some degree, I really feel like every knitting style is applicable to double knitting. Um, I, if I've taught people who Norwegian pearl how to double knit and if they can do it, so can you. Um, uh, it's just kind of a matter of trial and error to see what, uh, um, what works for you and, uh, and getting it smooth and feeling natural. And what about um, if you have tension issues between your pearl gauge and your knit gauge? How does that affect double knitting? Sure, gauge is actually a, a, an issue uh, as it is in single layer knitting, but I think a little more so in double knitting uh, because it does tend to differ somewhat from the single layer form um, using the same yarn and needles. So um, a lot of people find they have to go down a needle size, um, but really everybody's gauge is different, so swatch, I know it's a dirty word a little <laughs> bit, but um, um, swatch and uh, you'll be okay. But if your knit and purl gauges are a little different, there are a few things you can do. Uh, you can work flat because that alternates which row is purl and which is knit, um, the same as it does in single layer knitting, and so they tend to equalize. Um, but if you're doing something that's in the round and you want to try to equalize that, just do something with more color work in it because at every color change in a row, or round in this case, the color the the layers link together and so that stabilizes the fabric and it makes the uh, knit and purl gauges a little uh, less obviously different that's a really good tip now what about yarns i know that you tend to use the finer yarns what can you say about what yarns are good to use or even the fibers there are two things to keep in mind here uh, fiber content and weight first i'll say for weight um Keep in mind that what you're going to make is double thick. So you are making two layers of fabric at the same time, and you're going to end up with something that is twice as thick as the same yarn would have given you in single layer knitting. So if you do something in worsted weight yarn, it's going to end up sort of on the bulky side, um, which is one reason why I tend to work in finer gauge yarns, because I end up with something that uh, is a little more traditionally wearable. Um, as far as uh, fiber content goes, I find honestly that animal fibers work best here. It's a pretty springy fabric to begin with, um, and if you work in cotton, you're going to end up with uh, a fabric that stretches out and doesn't snap back. Um, and so uh, wool blends, um, that big adenith shawl I showed earlier was 100% alpaca. Silk blends work okay as well, surprisingly, and uh, it's just something that you need to play around a little bit with. And, and to be honest, acrylic is also all right. It's, it's been great listening to you. You definitely are the king of double knitting, like I said in the introduction. And that's mainly because you've been able to combine so many different techniques together with double knitting. So can, what techniques have actually been established as being able to com be combined with du double knitting? Um, maybe you can give us a little list of them and, and then you could say a couple of the challenges that you had to overcome with that. And then is there actually anything more that or further that you'd like to explore? I teach uh, nine different levels of double knitting, including the intro. So the other eight are two pattern double knitting, multicolor double knitting, textured double knitting, off the grid double knitting, which is sort of a tongue in cheek way of talking about decorative increases and decreases in double knitting, uh, double knit lace, double knit cables, double knit intarsia, and double knit entrelock. 
Uh, so those are the things I've developed so far. Uh, and I wanted to talk a little bit about um, a few of those. So I'm going to start off with double-knit cables. Um, this one is uh, the Vasily hat. This is where I thought cables could go um, as of 2011 when I initially designed uh, and released this pattern. And as you can see, there's no, uh, there are cables, but not cables traveling along a, uh, a background. Um, they just uh, braided cables all sort of mashed up next to each other to make this thing that almost looks a little bit like interlock, but isn't. Yeah. So the challenge here was to eventually do this. And um, predictably, uh, about three months after I released my first book um, that said cables can't travel, double knit cables can't travel along a, a, uh, a background, I figured out how to do it, and not just one method, but two. And this is one of the patterns that came out of that. Uh, it's called Heartbound Again, and it's in my book, Double or Nothing. That's really stunning. Have you, now this is a question, have you worked out how to do two different types of cables on, on both sides or is that? Oh, oh, um, like two pattern cable? Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, not yet, but um, I'm not going to say it's not possible. It's, so it's uh, still on your to-do list? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I have a whole bunch of things on the to-do list and I'll have to add that one in. Let me show double knit lace next. Uh, I did show some earlier. Um, so uh, I showed the Adenith shawl, the, the really big uh, shawl, but here's a smaller piece. This is called Spring Willow. Um, I released this as a standalone pattern uh, in double knit lace before I released the book, but it is also in uh, Double or Nothing. This is really the only way to do color work in lace uh, in any sort of um, practical way. What I've done here is I've sort of picked out an element of the lace that I liked and color changed it. But what this also does is it allows me to uh, link the fabric together because otherwise I just end up with two layers of lace that are um, separate. Yeah. Uh, so just like in regular double knitting, uh, you can separate the two layers um, up until the colors change. It's very this beautiful. is one of one of five different ways of, uh, of double knit lace that I figured out, um, and it's the one I prefer. So each of those five ways are essentially coming up with the same result, but the one you prefer is it fits your category of efficiency and elegance more. Is that right? Two two of them are coming out with the same same result essentially, or or they they look about the same. Uh, on the outside. The other three are ways of doing lace on one layer and the other layer plain uh, okay. or plain to some degree. Because that would be interesting too. You can do the, the um, different colored lace and have a different color plain showing through. Right. And that also gives you the ability to have a nice lacy hat that you can still wear in the winter. Yeah. So next up is uh, multicolor double knitting. Um, this is something that I have done a huge amount of, uh, both in extreme double knitting and in double or nothing, as well as outside both of those. I've done the 52 pickup that you saw earlier. I've done Parallax 3.0, which is right behind me. I wanted, when I did Double or Nothing, to uh, to show how to do this flat because all of the pieces I had done in it, in this technique in extreme double knitting had been done in the round. And so flat multicolor double knitting uh, requires uh, what is called a multicolor linked pair because there's a third color that is running inside the work uh, in, at every given pair. Uh, and so when it gets to the edge, when that strand runs to the edge, it has to get linked into the edge along with everything else and then go back in the other direction, or you end up with a hole. So um, so this was this is really one of my earliest um, uh, innovations, I suppose, in, in double knitting. Um, and this is the most recent uh, uh, example of it called Waterford Crossing from, um, from Double or Nothing. Tell me, have you had to do develop a series of, of um, side stitches or selvage stitches to be able to accommodate these techniques and things? Can you say something about that? Yeah, uh, edges have been a huge issue for me uh, over my, my career here, trying to find the cleanest and most repeatable edge. Um, the, uh, the initial edges that I was getting in slip stitch double knitting when I was first learning the technique um, were not clean and uh, I could make them repeatable, but I couldn't make them look really nice. Um, 
the uh, the next edge was just a, uh, a non-selv edge method that allowed me to do color work all the way to the edge, but it wasn't, again, very clean. The selv edge that I eventually developed, uh, which is a combination of what I call a linked pair and a slipped pair, um, one at the beginning and one at the end of every row, um, that finally gave me the clean, closed um, edge that I continue to use to this day. And the multicolor linked pair um, uh, was just one little addition to that. The edge looks the same, but structurally it allows me to add in a third or fourth or however many colors I need um, to run on the inside of the work without, uh, uh, without messing with the structure too much. And that edge um, you can use then on all the different techniques is that what you're saying that's right yeah you can you can switch back to mm -hmm. um to standard double knitting even if you're using textured double knitting or lace or something like that just for the edge um just for the, the those two pairs uh, at the very beginning and end of every row so what about entrelac what about entrelac this is really um one of the most fascinating pieces um i uh this is called fair Henri. it means um wrought ironwork um, in, uh, in French, and I hope I didn't butcher that too much for French speakers, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, you can see these sort of little wrought iron S's uh, going through it, but what's really interesting about this piece is in regular interlock in the round, uh, you end up with rings of diamonds. With this, you can see um, I've got four colors running in here, and they're going radially rather than concentrically. Uh, and this is a bit of a trick that I, um, that I can do because I'm doing it in double knitting. Every square you see is actually two colors. One of them is on the front and the other is on the back. And so at each new little diamond that I start, I can actually change colors, change which one is dominant. And so I can sort of position them as I want to position them, and I can make this radial pattern uh, in a way that, uh, that really isn't practical to do in single layer uh, interlock. And I'll just flip it inside out so you can see it is indeed completely reversible interlock. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. That's beautiful. Thank you. Okay, so out of everything that you've shown us just there, what's the, what's the top of the scale for difficulty? Oh, the entrelac, most definitely. Um, yeah. Although I really, I love the technique. It, uh, the two techniques go together so beautifully um, in ways that you would not expect unless you actually tried it. But it did take an entire chapter of uh, my book, Double or Nothing, to explain how to do that pattern. Uh, it definitely takes the cake for complexity. <laughs> You've also said something about wanting to develop a stitchinary, so... Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, I really, I, there are so many different things that I want to do in double knitting. And if every time I do one, I have to develop a pattern to show off how it works, um, it's going to take me forever. <laughs> so I figured a stitchinary would allow me to do um, a bunch of experiment, uh, experimenting with, with fabric characteristics and techniques and uh, develop new ways of using double knitting uh, as a translation from single layer knitting and and be a great resource for designers as well, hopefully, other people designing and double knitting. Yeah, that sounds good. So you can just concentrate on small examples of new techniques and people can just transfer that into a hat or a scarf as they wish. That's the hope. That's, that's really the way that uh, stitchinaries typically get used. So... Okay, now what are the challenges of notating all of these different techniques together with double knitting? Have you had to develop new terminology or symbols? So I try my best not to use um, too much new terminology uh, because I don't want it to be uh, too big of a learning curve. Um, but there are certainly situations where the, um, the fabric and the, the notation have to uh, indicate that there are pairs going on here, like the linked pair and the slipped pair that I mentioned earlier, and there are things like that. So in my first book, um, I, there was a, some reinvention of the wheel going on because I was doing it largely in a vacuum. I didn't uh, have as much uh, experience with designing and pattern writing as I do now. So in my second book, to make sure that everything was as clear and 
understandable by the largest number of people possible. Um, I actually formed a focus group of about a hundred knitters from uh, all over the uh, the ability spectrum, and got them to weigh in on key points in the in the book where I was trying to figure out how to express something either uh, in charts or in words. And uh, their their input really helped me make the book clearer. And then I took all of that when I did the revised edition of Extreme Double Knitting, and I put all of that decision making into into that as well. That sounds like a really clever way to handle that problem. <laughs> Especially with a with a technique like this which doesn't have a lot of prior documentation. Well, it's been fantastic to have you on the show and it's been really inspiring to see all of your designs and I think the viewers will agree with me and they're probably got to pick up their jaw from the floor. <laughs> but I think, like you said, it's just one step at a time. So they could start with some basic double knitting first and then gradually, with patience, increase their skills and, and perhaps one day knit a small, you can start off with a cowl or something, but something that's really beautiful and gorgeous like one of your designs. So thank you for sharing your time with us. Well, thank you so much. It's been a delight. Let's say goodbye to the audience. Bye. Bye. <laughs>